Onc Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onc Live. With glioblastoma, to make the diagnosis of glioblastoma, you need to get some tissue. As a surgeon, I'm involved in that all the time, either doing a biopsy or a surgical resection of the tissues. Once that tissue is taken out, it's still you're diagnosed by traditional pathologic methods. A piece of that tissue is taken out, it's, fr it's, it's frozen or put in paraffin, and then looked at under the microscope along with some stains. Now traditionally, when you look at a glioblastoma under the microscope, there are several things that sort of stand out. Um, you see some, several different cell types in there. You see vascular proliferation, which is what the bevacizumab works against. Um, you tend to see necrosis, areas where the tumor has grown so rapidly that it's outstripped its blood supply. Often in these, these areas of necrosis, which are areas where the tumor has outstripped its blood supply and the center of the tumor has died off, you see the tumor cells actually lining up two, three, or four cells deep all around that. And that's called pseudopalisading necrosis and is one of the hallmarks histologically of glioblastoma. Now, when I'm operating on a glioblastoma, the thing that tells me that I'm probably working with a, a glioblastoma is finding the areas of necrosis, dead, almost liquidy tissue in the center of the tumor, and very often there are thrombose blood vessels within that I really don't see in any other tumors that I take out. Glioblastomas uh, have as their uh, hallmarks uh, infiltrative nature, so it's very difficult often to discern a glioblastoma cell from normal brain tissue. They can be scattered widely throughout the brain, not just at the site where they occur. Uh, they are rapidly growing, and in fact, a patient with a glioblastoma can uh, have progression of their disease, doubling of their disease within the course of 10 days, which is unusual even for the most virulent kinds of cancer. Um, the one of the challenges of that type of behavior is, number one, getting the patient to therapy relatively quickly, which usually starts with an operation, uh, and then moving on to other treatments for the patient, which need to encompass a relatively wide penumbra around where the tumor is in order to encompass uh, errant cells that are occurring outside of the area where, for example, the initial surgery has occurred. One of the characteristics of glioblastomas is that they're able to harness abnormal blood vessels, and uh, they use these blood vessels, uh, it's believed, to propagate and uh, proliferate. Uh, the abnormal blood vessels are believed to bring in the nutrients that the cells need to survive and to grow. This property uh, is one of the aspects of glioblastomas that is thought to present a uh, therapeutic opportunity in terms of limiting the tumor's access to uh, the abnormal cells, the abnormal vessels that are needed to help it to thrive. Now over the past decade or two, we've started to try and develop molecular subclassifications of these tumors. Initially, back in 2006, they were first classified into three sets called proneuronal, mesenchymal, and proliferative types, which um, led to different prognostic factors. Some groups that I've been with and many other groups have tried to pull out different molecular markers that seem to be prognostic for this. However, the most important prognostic uh, categories that we've seen with glioblastoma include the MGMT methylation, which predicts whether they, or not they will respond to the alkylating agent temozolomide in that methylated groups. Uh, patients with methylation tend to do better prognostically, and they tend to be those who arose from lower-grade gliomas. But the most important progno single prognostic marker of the last few years have been the IDHs, the isocyanate dehydrogenase molecules, which are involved in the Krebs cycle. And what these seem to predict, really, is going back to a very old classification of glioblastomas. Before people started doing molecular classifications, they were sort of split into two major groups, which was the de novo glioblastoma, which usually occurred in elderly patients, often associated with epidermal growth factor receptor modifications, and the progressive glioblastoma, also called secondary glioblastoma. And these older classifications have been with us for about 20 or 25 years. The progressive glioblastomas were classically shown to have 
uh, retinoblastoma gene mutations as well as uh, p53 mutations but that group is really marked these days by the IDH1 mutations and those groups, those of the secondary or progressive glioblastomas with the IDH1 mutations tend to have the best overall prognosis when you're looking at a single gene. Now there are many, many different ways to subclassify the genes, the messenger RNA, the proteins of these to look for different prognostic factors. And those have been done by many, many different groups over many times. But we're still not quite to the point where we're ready to talk about personalized medicine or selecting a therapy off the shelf that attacks a particular molecular marker on a particular glioblastoma yet. Hopefully we're going to get there in the next few years and we are working on it. The other important thing to remember about glioblastoma and cancers in general is that you know, glioblastoma, originally called glioblastoma multiforme, or GBM, was called that because there are many different parts of it, and there are many different molecular signatures in different parts of the tumor. In fact, if you look at the tumor itself, it's made up of cancer stem cells, which help to repopulate the cancer, cancer stromal cells that are a bit more differentiated, endothelial cells and other vascular cells that are brought in, supporting glia from around the brain, that work with cytokine networks to perpetuate these, as well as the body's own immune modulatory cells that are coming in to try and attack the tumor is sometimes you know, taken over by some of the cytokine networks or intertalk between the tumor cells within that tumor organ that help perpetuate the tumor. So there are a lot of things, honestly, going on inside that tumor. And when we look at a lot of the data that's out there right now, most of the data initially was taken on these molecular markers from tumor samples that were homogenized and really contained a mixture of all these different cells. And what we're seeing investigators do these days is coming out, taking tumors out, and then micro-dissecting out the different cell types to look for gene signatures that are specific to each cell type. And one of our investigators here is working on a similar project today.